that's sometimes said now is that, that really we should have the country run by technocrats, you know, experts, get Steve Jobs running things and uh, philosophers and highly technical people. You don't want all these idiots kind of voting in uh, a democratic government because they're just going to use the government to satisfy their desires to just drink beer and lie about or whatever and society will go to the dogs. Um, well, if, 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 if summing up uh, places, it's a bit difficult for us to to and fro in the studio at the moment because it's rigged up. But uh, back to Brian. I just thought it, it might be a useful time, uh, Chris, if if you wanted to explore the idea of Plato's forms, because it, in the lecture you did sort of touch on this uh, towards the end. Um, I think it's any discussion of Plato, particularly Plato's Republic, or or the idea of uh, philosophers or souls in the Platonic way. In some way, we have to address the idea of forms. Yeah, this is. Um crucial to platonic philosophy or idealist philosophy as, as it's called basically as we go through hcj you will see that two main schools of thought about how we know things there is those people who say that uh, you're born like a blank slate like uh, john locke and you you, you dealt with him uh, in the lecture today uh, you're born as a blank slate and the world writes upon upon you and uh, through your senses and that's how you know things uh, that's completely opposite to the other school of thought that mainly traced back to Plato, usually it's a conventional thing. And he says that um, uh, the crucial thing to me is that Plato is very sort of Buddhist or Hindu in a way. He, he believes in reincarnation and he believes everybody has lived before and that when we're reborn to this life, in a kind of descent really, things are, you know, you're going down in these circles of... Um, uh, rebirth you remember a much better world in your previous life and so whenever you have the sensation that you're observing something perfect or good um, then it's a memory it's a remembering of of these perfect forms so uh, he gives the example of the chair so everybody has an idea of a chair that you you can sit on uh, but everybody's idea of that chair in our world is flawed it's or, or let's say it's different but there must be a perfect chair that is the model for all chairs, and all chairs are just imperfect versions of that. And in the same way, there would be a perfect human form, a perfect female form, a perfect male form, and artists, the work of artists is to approximate towards that form. Uh, and then finally on the forms, he, he says the perfect forms are immortal, um, and the, uh, perfection for him is the same thing as immortality so when perfection is achieved this uh, terrible cycle of uh, rebirth and regeneration comes to an end because perfection is achieved so for example he thought that metal uh, sorry that gold was was the perfect metal or the perfect substance and he believed it was eternal it didn't it decay he didn't know that eventually even gold decays at the subatomic level but as far as the Greeks were aware it never rusted nothing ever so it was the perfect substance and all other substances were just imperfect forms of gold which was why you could buy anything with gold in the greek world and and the gold superstition is very interesting because it's still it still still persists is that enough on the form do you want to chip yeah. in on the forms no i think that's i think that's exactly right it, i mean it's a it's a difficult idea and it's something that it takes a lot of uh work for people to full, fully take it on board but um i think it's good for us to to sort of um discuss it even for a brief time so that people have a sort of an idea of where Plato was, was uh, trying to, well, what he was trying to achieve uh, with his idea of the Republic. But if, if, if we move on, if we take the idea of the um, social contract, which in some way uh, Crito has established, or in, in the Crito uh, Plato has established, one of the people that defined or framed or um, pushed on this idea uh, tremendously was uh, Thomas Hobbes in his... Uh, seminal work the leviathan and this was a work that still resonates now and it is in some ways a product of its time uh, hobbes was living through um, chaotic times it was there was a civil war the king was executed uh, things were he was in exile things were changing uh, the society was changing dramatically and before his eyes he could see a hellish situation where a brother was fighting against brother, where uh, the whole nation, the whole society seemed to be collapsing um, in, a, in a nightmarish slaughter. And so the Leviathan is, in a lot of ways, a response to this. It is a, it is a response to a collapsing society. 
One of the key things that we must address even momentarily when we discuss the social contract is the um, the idea of the state of nature, the idea that before any laws, before any government, before <coughs> any sort of civilization, uh, there was uh, and existed a situation where people lived in, without laws. And to understand philosophers like Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau, I think what we need to uh, think about is how can we imagine or what do we think a society like that would or uh, an existence like that would be like. And this plays into our idea of what human nature is like. What, hu what is human nature like when it's unruled, when there are no laws? Um, for Hobbes, maybe because of what he witnessed in those uh, difficult, difficult years of the Civil War, he saw uh, society as being um, potentially um, nightmarish um, with uh, war all against all, nasty, brutish and short, as he imagined it. Um, and the only way to address this was through a all-powerful ruler. Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, contemporary historians are, are digging into more and more just how incredibly violent the the, uh, the wars of the 1600s were um, compared to uh, con contemporary. I mean, many people thought it was the end of the world. I mean, you, you get these Protestant sects who think that this is the sign of the apocalypse and so forth. It was so brutal, particularly in uh, your own country, Ireland, where and some enormous proportion of the population was engaged in slaughter. Um, that was on a bigger proportionate scale than even modern warfare. And that's contrasted with the warfare of the Middle Ages, which was governed by rules of chivalry, very limited engagement, a knight, a few professional soldiers, and suddenly you've got whole populations rising up, murdering each other on a huge scale. So that, that, I think that context is important. But um, in terms of the categories of time we use, we've now switched very much from the classical time, almost a thousand years, we've come almost a thousand years later, we've leapt over the so-called uh, Dark Ages to the political philosophy of the, of the early modern time with, with, with Thomas Hobbes. That process of emerging from the Dark Ages, sometimes known as the Renaissance. Now I know you talked about Rousseau there quickly, but we're going to come back to him and Locke. But, the preeminent figure of Renaissance political theory is Machiavelli, and you mentioned some of his work, and I know that you're a great enthusiast for Machiavelli, so perhaps we could draw this to a conclusion, because uh, we've got only a few minutes left now, um, with uh, a quick introduction um, to Machiavelli and, wh and wh what people might read more about him. If they want to know about Machiavelli, they, they must read his book, The Prince, and The Prince is, um, is considerably different from the, the other works that we've discussed already. It is a, a very practical work. It is um, a work that is steeped in the ethos of the Renaissance. It is about humanity and it's about pragmatism. Um, it, we, we must remember that the, one of the key phrases uh, associated with the Renaissance is that man is the measure of all things. So there was a new attitude, a new attitude of humanism. And, and a rejection of Plato, a re rejection of Plato and Aristotle to some extent. Yeah, because they were seen largely as uh, being responsible for the dogma that had admired all intellectual thought for so, such a long time. And, and the idea there was a pre-existing perfect form of the state. So Machiavelli is much more, well, what, do peop what are people actually like? Let's go with the flow. Let's not go against the grain of human nature. Not, let's not try and set up a perfect golden republic run by golden people like Plato advocates. Is, is that more or less it? Well, that's exactly right, because because at the beginning he says that we, we can't make rules, we can't govern with a, a dreamlike state. We have to govern with the situation that lies on the ground, um, because otherwise uh, it's, it's impossible. We, and the key thing is that he isn't guided in any way by morality or Christian ethics. He is morality. He's guided by how to be effective, how to get power, how to hold power, how to subject people. The the key thing about uh, Machiavelli is that he represents in one man um, an insight into the dramatic period that was the Renaissance. Um, I'd love to have more time about to, to discuss Machiavelli because he does deserve more time. But uh, maybe uh, perhaps in our next podcast we can touch on him again.
I'm sure we'll come back to him again and again. That's all we've got time for this week. So Brian, I'd like to thank you, and Karen and Jake, the production team, thanks for you as well.